What better way to spend over four and a half hours on a holiday weekend Sunday than watching a wrestling pay-per-view? Holy hell. Double or nothing wasn't double or nothing better compared to other AEW pay-per-views I've seen in the past. I thought this one was a bit of a hot mess, honestly. Is it the worst work they've ever done? Probably not. But it's certainly not in that top tier. They've put on some really good shows over the years. Some great ones. Some middle-of-the-road ones. This is on the lower end of that road. And if this really bothers you that much, that anybody provides any feedback about the product that you love, then I wonder, like, how successful are you in your personal life outside of the wrestling bubble? Like, are you that insecure where you can't accept any feedback or any negative criticism at all? Because I got a couple of things, even before I talk about the show itself, just in general. Number one, this show was too damn long. Going over four and a half hours is ridiculous. Either have more pay-per-views, so you don't have to try and force as many matches onto the card as possible. Or have better match discipline and pick and choose your spots. The excuse of, well, he bought extra pay-per-view time because of blah, blah, blah. Who gives a crap? Don't do it. Well, who's worried about going up against Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals? Then you know what you do? You have the pay-per-view Saturday night, jerks. If you look at this card, three or four of these matches could have easily been on a Dynamite or a Rampage and would have been just fine. Now, I will admit that the experience in Vegas was probably much better in person having to sit through four and a half plus hours of damn wrestling. Um, but watching it at home, it fucking sucked. And, and to me, the other key problem with this show, if you can't do it right, just don't do it. Almost every match had one or more notable botches. God, Jeff Hardy's boot is loose, and then he's slipping trying to get on the top rope. You, know, you got Brody King sitting there, God damn, son, that ring apron's got a family. Like match after match after match. It was botchiness and sloppiness. And I understand some of you have very low standards now. As long as people attempt shit, you give them a participation trophy. You give them the benefit of the doubt. And you say, hey, this is great because they did moves. But we shouldn't excuse it just because they do a bunch of moves. We shouldn't call it great when it has this many mistakes. I grant you. Like exe wrestling execution, you know, it's a very well choreographed dance. And things have to go perfectly. But damn it. You shouldn't call it great when it wasn't great. And this show last night was not great. It wasn't. There was some good stuff on this show, but god damn. The mental gymnastics you see from these folks that are so in bed with Tony Khan and AEW to defend and prop up everything about this damn company is fucking ridiculous. And that's just talking about the media members. I mean, you talk about the fans. Then you see like the footage of the post uh, show scrum by Tony Khan and looking kind of dumb, frankly. You know, some folks are going to gravitate toward that. That's more of a personal opinion, whether you like the way he kind of approaches things sometimes. And sometimes I like the energy and sometimes I think he acts like a dopey moron. It can be both. Um, but, you know, I'm sure the wrestling journalist asked really tough pointed questions and didn't let Tony Khan skate on anything. <laughs> I couldn't even get through that with a straight face. Uh, but yeah, man, this show was too fucking long. Especially for those watching at home. There's no excuse for that. Do better. And if you can't do the shit right in your matches, then ding dong dumb dicks, don't do it. This is like a recurring theme, trend, pattern. Be better. But anyways, let's talk about what we actually saw on the show. Is it a work if you're the only one that's in on it? You're going to have folks that are now trying to say that the whole MJF, MJF crap was a work. Work for who? Work by him, for him, and nobody else? Sure. Now all of a sudden, oh, he was always planning to go on the card first. Maybe he was. Maybe he wasn't. But I personally wasn't so surprised that MJF and Wardlow was first because that way if he went out there and he didn't give a shit at all and the match sucked, at least it was buried early in the show. And you could get him in there and say, hey, get this done, do the honor for Warlow, and then you could get out of Dodge. Like, yeah, that's right, MJF, you do that. 
But it did feel like MJF wasn't fully into things. Like you could just tangibly feel a difference. That said, this match worked and did everything it needed to. The 10 power bombs by Wardlow, like this was really, really good. So no real criticisms there. For the next match, I'll say this. At least the Bucks of Suck put over the ump and coming Hardys. You know, you got to watch these guys, these Hardy brothers. That Matt and that Jeff. Like, they're going places, folks. Like, their future is ahead of them. And it's bright. So thankfully, the Bucks of Suck did the right thing for business by putting these talented up-and-comers over. Even though typical of a Bucks of Suck match is even when you have the big swanton spot with Jeff onto the freaking ring steps. And that was that looked crazy. Like, you could have done the pinfall there, but no, you've got to get in one more move, one more set of bullshit before you finish it off. Like, again, less is more. Um, the TBS Championship. First off, I want to say, for all of you assholes that have followed me for long enough, why the hell weren't more of you telling me about the baddies? How dare you not tell me that Jade Cargill's got a couple of chicks running along with her now and it's Red Velvet and Kira Hogan. You didn't think this was a fucking important detail to tell me! Now, Dallas Croyer, there's a real one. They told me. They let me know ahead of time, weeks ago. All of you other assholes said bumpkiss, nothing. One big double middle finger to all of you. It's probably what it felt like when you watch this match, because, yeah, this match was not it. It was rough. It was botchy. It was everything else. You know, ugh, it was not good. Um... I guess my only other question about this match in, in the finish, like, once you get to the finish, like, you have a, a Stokely Hack Hathaway come out. Cool. Like, that's cool. Like, I think he certainly makes a lot more sense as Jay Cargill's manager. I and mean, that's what they did with the Smart Mark Sterling stuff to bring in Stokely Hathaway. Like, perfect. Run with that. But then you're also having Athena appear. Like, did you really need to do both of them? Couldn't you have done one at the pay-per-view and another one on Dynamite or Rampage? Yeah, I'm probably nitpicking, but fuck it. Sometimes you have to nitpick these things. And am I supposed to care about the House of Black and or Death Triangle? Just like when Andrade was introducing some wrestler that I've never seen, and I don't give two shits about, like, this is going to be a big deal. Shit, I thought Ric Flair was going to be walking through the door. He was talking about the best wrestler in the world. <laughs> that would have been funny. But, um, like, House of Black and Death Triangle. Am I supposed to care about this? And am I supposed to really care about Julia Hart? Coming in with this great value of Alexa Bliss gimmick. Who gives a shit? Oh, Malachi Black's going to do big things in AEW. <laughs> that work out, assholes. Now, another highlight for this show for me was the Owen Hart Tournament Finals. Not so much for the matches. I did not think the matches were all that good at all. But it was really, really cool for me to hear so much in recent weeks and on this show even about the life and the legacy and the career of Owen Hart. You know, Owen Hart was so much more than just the way he met his untimely demise. And he certainly was, he certainly was better than his brother Brett. He was better. Better. I listed out the reasons on Twitter and I didn't even bring up the talk on the mic stuff. Just saying. Owen will always be better than Brett. But the matches were kind of, eh. I, I personally didn't have much of a problem with Adam Cole and Dr. Britt Baker winning. Um, not a fan of either match, but the outcomes made sense. Like, especially if you were doing some type of power couple stuff here. But, like, Samoa Joe or Adam Cole, either way, didn't really matter. And for those of you that are going to say, well, what about May Ruby Soso? Why, like, why didn't she win? Well, maybe it's because they've got her now and they realize, oh, she's actually not that good. Like, some of you think that she's really, really good. She's really, really not. I'm just saying. Um, as far as the folks that are going to say that this is just a money grab by Martha, number one, so what if it is? Number two, hate to speak for the dead, especially somebody I didn't know, but I imagine somebody that grew up and spent his life working in the wrestling business, Owen would probably be okay with his family trying to make some money off of his name. That'd be just a thought to me. And number three, if it means that a new generation of fans is introduced to the greatness of Owen Hart, if it means that we actually hear Owen Hart being referenced on wrestling broadcasts, 
if it means that we get to hear about him all the time, I am all for that. If it means that Owen's family is taken care of as a part of this and that money is raised for his founda the foundation in his name, then that is a fucking win. And if you don't like that, you're a monster. You're probably one of those idiots that thinks thoughts and prayers stop school shootings. Um, speaking of wishing things would stop, at least Sammy and Ty Conte, I'll, I'll give them this, with the Maleficent shit, like at least they're embracing the hate, but this match sucked. Like, this was another one that could have been on TV. Same thing to me with Kyle O'Reilly and Darby Allen. It was meh. TV match to me. And like having Car Kyle O'Reilly go over, really? Interesting. I thought Darby Allen was one of your pillars of AEW. And you were you're replacing a pillar of vanilla with a pillar of marble. Oh god, whatever. I did enjoy, however, the AEW Women's Championship match. I enjoyed Thunder Rosa's ring gear. Thought it looked great. Looked great on her. You know, the the shout out to Uvalde in the uh, in the actual ring gear. I thought the match was good. I enjoyed it. Anarchy in the ring. Like, that was brutal. It was a magnificent train wreck. Like, you've got the people talking about on Twitter, Eddie Kingston looking like this one of the screen grabs from Grand Theft Auto 5 coming out with the freaking uh, gas can and all of this, like, am I personally a little disappointed that Brian Danielson didn't politic his way out of eating the double submission here? But maybe you could also say is that it took both Jericho and Hager to submit him. So if somebody's going to say, well, we want you to do the honors, and he says, well, that doesn't work for me, brother. But then they say, it's going to require two people to submit you out, and you're still not going to tap. Maybe that did work for him, brother. So maybe he is still America's greatest politician. I put more faith in him in terms of politics than anybody else that's in elected office today, that's for sure. But yeah, the anarchy in the ring, I would have liked this a whole lot more if I wasn't already over this pay-per-view at this point, because again, the show was too fucking long. If there's a match from this show that I really actually do want to go back and watch again, it will be this one. Because I could watch it when I'm fresher and I have more energy. I probably would enjoy it a whole lot more, honestly. Uh, the Tag Team Championship. Swerve Strickland's really cool. And to me, I'm sorry, but Keith Lee is just kind of there at this point. Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs deserve better. Uh, Ricky Starks and him walking on the ropes and doing that shit. Like, that's why Ricky should be pushed more. He should be a much bigger deal. I guess here's what I don't understand. You really don't put your tag champs again in an interesting story again. So you kind of throw them into this random ass tag title match. And then it seems like a tag team that has quite a bit of momentum about them, FTR, was nowhere to be found in the show. That was really, really weird. The hard on for this company when it comes to Jungle Boy just knows no bounds, I guess. I don't really know. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the only thing that mattered about this show was whether this company was going to go by the old established hand to be their AEW world champion. Were they going to go with the known proven commodity? Were they going to go with the guy with more experience there in the company? Or were they going to let the young lion roar in CM Punk? He's got his best years ahead of him, baby. The future is now. And certainly this match was far from a work of art. CM Punk had a couple of spots he didn't do very well, especially when you're talking about the uh, Lariat. Yeah, he messed that up a couple of times, but you got to give him a break here. He's pretty new on the AEW scene. Like this is a lot of pressure to go up against a, an established name like Hangman Adam Page in AEW. Like, Punk's got nerves because he knows he's going to be put in this spot as a young lion. He knows that he's going to be given this belt. He's going to be given a chance to take it and run with it until he can't run any longer and hide from Sting because we all know hashtag Punk fears Sting and they face off at Bound for Glory, damn it. It can happen. For the AEW World Championship, it only feels right. But CM Punk is the AEW World Champion. Roar, young lion! Roar!